Hi friends, today I want to talk about COVID-19 and pregnancy, the updates. This is July 2020 and I want to update you on what we know now. Hi friends, welcome back. As we all know, the COVID-19 global pandemic is not going away. I'm a fertility doctor, and so I talk about COVID every single day because my patients are trying to make decisions. Is it safe to get pregnant? What does this mean if I get pregnant? Should I delay my fertility care? So this is hot, hot topic. The number one thing I'm gonna be going over is an article from this. This is called the Gray Journal, and it's one of the big journals in OBGYN. It's the American Journal of OBGYN, notably called the Gray because the color. Okay, this is from July 2020, so it's from this month. Granted, if you're watching this video later on, the data we talk about today may not be applicable, and some of the things that are published in the main study I'm going over, already we have contradictory results. COVID-19 is novel, a novel coronavirus, which means new. And I know it's not the first time I've said it, but anytime you have a new thing, it takes time to get data. You have to know that that means that things are always changing. This doesn't mean that your doctors or the medical community is wrong. It just means that as we learn more, we can have better information to guide you and give you information. But in this journal, what we're going over is an article that was published, which is coronavirus disease in 2019. So this is a review of cases. And so it's a retrospective review. What that means is they took six different studies that have been reported and they put them all together to have a higher N. When you look at scientific studies, you're always looking at the N, the number of people involved. The lower the N, the harder it is to generalize results and the more variability there may be in what they find. Meaning you can take a study with a small N, find an association or a correlation apply it to a population, and then you see that that association no longer stands true. So anytime you see a study with a small n, you always want to keep an eye open to understand that this is usually preliminary data, and it may not hold up when you have more data altogether. But looking at six individual studies that each only have a few patients, that's very, very small n. So they pulled six studies together, have a total of 51 pregnant patients. So these are retrospective studies. This means that the six different studies all happened in China, they're all retrospective. And so what that means is that they had patients, they looked back on their care, and then reported the outcomes. That is not the highest level quality science, but it is what we have. Side note, I have an MSCR. That's a Master's of Science in Clinical Research. That means that I spent a couple extra years in grad school going over clinical research specifically in scientific studies so that I could better understand them and interpret those results to take care of my patients and explain literature to others. So I'm using that knowledge when we review studies like this now. If you like going over scientific studies on the channel, please let me know because our journals put out things all the time and I'd be more than happy to break them down for you, the good, the bad, the ugly, so that we can understand literature better together. But today we're starting with this one. So 51 women pulled together, all from China, all pregnant, all in the third trimester. So if you are a first trimester patient who gets COVID, this may not be applicable to you. We don't have good understanding of the first trimester yet. And I'll give one push to a study that we're doing at four, which is my fertility practice in combination with UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. It is a study to look at COVID-19 and early pregnancy. All you have to be is a pregnant woman between four to 10 weeks pregnant. You don't have to be my patient. You don't have to live in California or Austin, Texas. It is all survey study and they're gonna send you free screening tests. So I will link that in the notes and please, please, if you're pregnant or you know somebody pregnant, send that study information on to them because we can get better data with more numbers. All right, so briefly, this is how I go through studies. Number one, what's the objective? What are they trying to do? They are trying to learn more about COVID-19 and pregnancy. I think we can all agree that that's important. Number two, the methods. So what did they do? Six studies pulled them together. Then the researchers went through and extracted data from those studies. So this is really secondary analysis because it wasn't the primary. So they pulled all the data together and then put it into one data set so they could have that higher number. Okay, and you always wanna look at the quality of those studies because junk in, junk out. And so for this study, what they wanted to have is an actual diagnosis of COVID-19. Remember that was really hard at the beginning. They also had to be pregnant patients who had some follow-up. And so there's usually 
usually a chart and this one's right here and it's listing the studies that are included in the analysis. So when you list the studies that are included in the analysis, you can see that each individual report had very few patients. So one had nine, 13, three, 16, nine, and one. Independently, too small to draw real conclusions from. Pooled together, we have a little bit stronger analysis. So then what we looked for is we wanna go forward and look at the results. So what were they actually looking to go and see? The first thing that's always reported in results is going to be a description of your population. So when you're writing a paper and you're writing a results section, paragraph one, describe your population. That's important for applicability. So does the study apply to other pregnant patients? If everybody in the study was 51, it may not. So a quick description of the population, paragraph one, mean maternal age was 30 years, so average for pregnant women. The mean gestational age, so age of delivery, was 36.5 weeks, so that is early. And it says 15% delivered before 37 weeks, so 37 weeks is usually what we consider term, and 40 weeks is usually what we give you your due date at. We could have a whole video on how complicated that is, because you're actually two weeks pregnant before you ovulate because pregnancy calculators are all based on your last menstrual period, another day. And in most cases, symptom onset started one to seven days before delivery. Only 69% of patients had symptoms and the most common symptoms were fever, dry cough, or fever on the postpartum period. So they didn't even have symptoms upon arrival. Importantly, none of these patients had pre-existing comorbidities like high blood pressure or diabetes. That's really important because that may skew the data and risk factors. So these were all healthy women in pregnancy that were around 30 years of age with no other risk factors. So 51 cases, 49 of them were in the third trimester and we have delivery data on 48 patients. Of the 48 patients, 46 had a C-section. That's a huge number, you guys. That is not a normal C-section rate. Normal C-section rates usually hover around 20-ish percent. So coming in here at over 90% C-section rate, I mean, this is huge. So here's a disease that causes respiratory symptoms, but suddenly 90% of people had a C-section. Why'd they have C-sections? So 34 cases gave us data on why C-sections were done. And we look at them, COVID pneumonia, preterm rupture of membranes, fetal distress, and preterm labor were the top indications. So these are things that would not have happened. So the theory here is that preterm labor, premature rupture membranes, disfetal distress, and being severely ill from COVID pneumonia put these women at higher risk for C-section. And even further alarming is that so many of these were early, and this is much higher than the normal population would have delivered these at. So here we have a group of women, previously healthy, all got COVID, now they're at higher risk of preterm birth and of C-section. Sadly, there was one fetal death in a severely ill patient. Further, there was one stillbirth in a mom as well. So here's a group where we analyzed follow-up from 48 women, 46 of them had C-section. There was one fetal death that happened at nine days of life and one stillbirth. That's high for a population. So when we look over this, we're finding out there was no evidence of vertical transmission. None of the infants were tested positive for COVID. So that's reassuring. This shows us that Vertical transmission isn't necessarily the number one risk to a baby, that there can be fetal implications, including stillbirth or fetal demise from moms being severely compromised. All right, so for this article, let's read the conclusions out loud. Although vertical transmission of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 infection, has been excluded thus far and the outcome for mothers and neonates has been generally good, the high rate of preterm delivery by cesarean delivery is a reason for concern. Coronavirus disease 2019, associated with respiratory insufficiency in late pregnancies, certainly creates a complex clinical scenario. That is this study. Now, even since this has been reported, there have now been cases of vertical transmission reported. Whether this is truly vertical transmission or if it happened during labor or if it happened right after birth, that can be hard to distinguish 100%. So it does look like the coronavirus may pass from mom to baby through the placenta. We know that the placenta, the organ that connects mom and baby, is super important in pregnancy. And so what happens is that if that placenta gets little blood clots in it or doesn't function well, the baby is then at risk. We are concerned that some of this data from placental insufficiency is resulting in higher risks such as stillbirth, fetal death, preterm labor. What do you do with all this information? And I think that's the most important thing. Am I telling patients to stop getting pregnant at this moment? I'm not. What I am saying though is you have to know the risks of getting pregnant. And notably, if you have a risk of severe illness, a higher risk of getting admitted to the ICU and being on a ventilator, which has been shown if you're pregnant, 
the CDC has now upclassified pregnant women as a high risk category. When we did the last video back in March, that's not what I said. So now pregnant women have a higher risk of getting admitted to an ICU and being on a ventilator than non-pregnant women who are age match peers. They don't have a higher risk of death, maternal death, so that's good, but higher risk of severe illness, higher risk to mom and baby both. So if you're trying to get pregnant, you need to know that that is a risk. What does that mean from you? Do not do things that are risky if you do not have to. Wear a mask. Do not go to Target unless you have to, right? Order things online, send somebody else, don't go to the neighbor's barbecue, wear a mask, socially distant, reduce your risk as much as possible. Because if we know you're a high risk group and you are doing risky behaviors, please tell me how that makes sense. This is time for you to prioritize yourself and your baby and your body. It is okay to say no to things and say, I need to stay home right now. My job is to Netflix and chill and just stay to baby. What's wrong with that? Also, some patients who are super high risk are choosing to delay based on your area. So in Austin right now, we're pretty high. We're hopefully plateauing, but to be honest, we're not on the downswing. So some of my patients who are essential workers, frontline, ER, ICU, nurses, physicians, we're purposefully choosing to put a few month pause because we'd at least like to see the numbers trend in a better direction. And that is okay too. This is a complex decision. It is going to take talking to your partner if you have one, talking to your support system, talking to your employer, and most of all, talking to your doctor if you're undergoing fertility treatments. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Again, let me know if you wanna see more of these. If you want to see journal reviews, as always, I love your feedback. So please tell me what you want to see. I'd love it if you'd subscribe to the channel that helps spread my message of educating women to more and more people. You can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD and the podcast is as a woman. You can find it on any podcast player. There's lots of fertility episodes there and they're now all being dumped into YouTube as well. So if YouTube is your channel du jour, you can look under the playlist under the as a woman podcast and you can see 70 plus episodes for your listening pleasure. Thank you guys so much.